meeting. My name is John Bly with the Engineering Contractors Association, chair of this August committee, and I uh, wanted to thank Mosa for covering for me last month. I had a little medical procedure that I had to get done, but thank you very much, Mosa. So we're going to do self-introductions, and uh, I want you guys to participate, too. So this is the most we've ever had for public out there. Go ahead, Mosa. Glad to see you back. Yeah, Some staff. Uh, Mosa, that's you representing the Santa Rosa <laughs> Metro Chamber. Steve Erdogan with the transport or with the Sierra Club. Okay, that's it. <laughs> that's hats. it. <laughs> Two hats. <laughs> Jeff Blakesley with SOS Roads. Mark Hale representing BIA. Jerry Glaser with the North Bay Electric Auto Association. Perfect um, timing, Jake. Uh, Ross Clendon, SCPA. What am I doing? You're introducing yourself. Hi, I'm Jake McKenzie. And I was driven here by Emeritus Prof Professor Lutman, who is parking the car. Okay, great. We'll have a quorum then. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Now we got it. Go ahead. We'll keep going this way. We'll go back. Thank you. Thank you. Eris Weaver, Sonoma County Bicycle Coalition. Tom Banning, District 3. Tom Conlon, Sonoma County Conservation Council. Sonoma County Transportation Authority. And we got Jake. Uh, Brian, would you introduce yourself? Brian Ling, uh, District 4 representative. Okay. And I know we got a mixture of staff and public. Go ahead and shout it out, guys. Who are you? Chris Barney, SCTA. Okay. I'm Heather Michael, I'm the Chief Financial Officer with Mark. Oh, okay. Thank you. I'm I'm Linda Chaffin from the Cloverdale Senior Center, still shopping for a ride to the airport. Steve Rivera, CTA. Uh, Judy Bulls, CTA. All right, and I believe we have a quorum. Uh, <laughs> Can so I have good. a comment, Chair? Yes, absolutely. Please. Because I see on the roster we have uh, four defenses. You see, mm -hmm. we have you know five vacant mm -hmm. positions. You know, it, is there an effort you know to do an outreach? Sorry, is there an effort to do an outreach to these organizations? You know to help have a representative to our group. Yeah, this has come up several times in the past, and it, uh, I don't know who's handling it for yeah, staff. So you guys, that would, that would be me. Okay, um, primarily. So we have. Basically, we had a uh, few of these are still looking for representatives. Some of them, like Sonoma County Tourism, came last time. I think that may still be a hard thing to do consistently, but um, in the end, it will take a, uh, an update of the, the admin code if we're going to permanently make changes there. Um, so I think, you know, we keep trying to get the word out in terms of the fact that these are in-person meetings and trying to get these organizations to be sure and uh, nominate people, but it's it's an ongoing effort. But my understanding, uh, we have attendance threshold for our members, you know, here. If a member will not attend, I forgot how many meetings, you know, <laughs> like... We, we count as a vacancy. Ah, you counted as a vacancy? Yeah. Basically, what we did earlier in the year was uh, essentially if you miss a certain amount of meetings, you were it is not considered a vacancy and will not be counted towards the forum. However, I'm still reaching out to those groups because uh, we like them. But I think, you know, if an organization has a seat vacant, you know, let us say for a certain time. It is, you know, fair to drop off that, you know, organization from our group, you know. Absolutely. But to, to do that, we will need to do the admin code switch, which we need to present it to the board. Um, the suggested change, let them know that that's going to be coming and then and the following. And, and again, to go back in, in history, for, for those of us that went through this before, I think even Suzanne spoke to it about a year ago when this came up and the 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 folks that are on the roster were basically 
convened because they had a stake in the original sales tax measure. Is, am I stating that correctly? And so they were stakeholders, influencers back then, uh, whether they have chosen to represent themselves on this ongoing committee uh, or not, they, they were still invited in the very beginning. And that's why it's kind of etched in stone, if you will. But we can, we can move to uh, make changes if we, if we choose to. It's, it's not complete stone because changes have been made. Yeah. yeah. Been, 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 Are we... Um, two, two years. Are we entertaining a motion to to uh, drop some of these I would, organizations? I, I would, Can we do that I if it wasn't on the agenda? Not on the agenda. Where's Letman? <laughs> I would, Can we do that if it's not on the agenda? Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, it is not a motion. It is a recommendation probably to place it in... Uh, the agenda of the next meeting to consider changes, you know, like to our code. We cannot just drop an organization. So probably, you know, starting next year, we say if an organization will not show up for a year, you know, for example, we'll drop them off from the membership, you know. Fair enough. Got that? Got it. Okay. Um, so thank you for the introductions. We do have a quorum and we're in public comment at this point before we get into any administrative items. Um, Tom has one. I'm just gonna report out on a couple of things that I've heard about from um, members of the community. Uh, in my role as a member of vice chair of the city of Sonoma's Climate Action Commission, we received an email from a representative of Sonoma Valley, who was disappointed that the city did not include in our climate action plan draft any measures to increase transit service in Sonoma Valley. When I responded that that was not within the jurisdiction of the city, but that it was under the Sonoma County Transit Agency's jurisdiction, I got a very respectful note back saying that it respectfully disagree that the city should in fact uh, take this into consideration as one of the concerns of the city as well. So I just wanted this body to be aware of that. Uh, the transit remains an important and public concern in the county of Sonoma, Sonoma Valley in particular. Secondly, uh, personal anecdote, I took the survey from Sonoma County Transit um, and post received a super pass promotion in the mail I completed the survey on June 1st. It was postmarked for June 1, and it, I received it in my mailbox on June 8th. The week-long free valid for all fair categories expired on June 8th, the day I received it in my mailbox. So I just want you to be aware that we're being very fiscally prudent <laughs> in our, our incentives uh, for taking the survey. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, go ahead. So, I'm Jerry. Um, and with that in line, two things. Uh, one is in Sebastopol, uh, the city council took action and managed to get a local bus, which uh, Sonoma County uh, Transit is providing and the city supplements um, that. I think the county pays most of it given um, with the services now which we pay. Uh, and then also the question about uh, free. I, I entered uh, and completed one of the surveys as well and got a free pass as well, which I received two days after ex it expired. So you're two days after. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Program's been a success so far. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are you entertaining comments? From we are. Brian, did you have something you wanted to? Go ahead, Jake, you go first. Um, I, I'm uh, disappointed that I'm not going to be re representing Sonoma County on the RM3 Funding Oversight Committee because Chair Corsi asked me if I would serve as one of the two members from Sonoma County, but the, uh, the rules governing membership require that you never have served with the Metropolitan Transportation or, or BATA. So uh, a lot of yourself. knowledge is evidently a dangerous thing. <laughs> so I don't know if anybody else is 
even interested in serving in that committee, but uh, the kind Board of, of Supervisors, I believe, will be appointing in the, uh, maybe the 17th of July members to that oversight. And now that the money is out of escrow from the toll co collections. If anybody is interested, would they go, uh, go through? To, I would go to, to, go to Chris, the supervisor. Okay. I don't, unless uh, Suzanne or anybody uh, has any thoughts? I am five on the agenda with um, staff and talk to you, but nothing on that. Okay, thank you. Can I say support of order? I thought that where we are on the agenda is public comment, public as comment. in the people out there as opposed to the members of the board. I think the public comment and board comment are can be handled the same way. Oh. Yeah. Not agenda items. Non -agenda items. Okay. We might want to change that okay. to non agenda okay. comments. Just, just thanks. Just one clarification. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I've got one concern that's come up, and, and it's a, it, it, my prior career. Um, years oh. ago, I spent 25 years in the manufacturing of, of uh, heavy duty truck trailer. Uh, truck trailer equipment and trailers, trucks. We're Peterbilt truck dealer. We are a reliance manufacturer. We built dump trucks right here in Katati. Um, thousands of them. Anyway, um, you might recall back when uh, it was decided after a number of years of fighting not to uh, dredge a more rock out of Russian River. Um, and at that point, uh, the point I'm getting to is trucking. We started selling a whole lot more dump trucks because a whole lot more dump trucks had to be on the road from, from the uh, Central Valley to bring rock into Sonoma County that could no longer be cut, taken out of the river. And um, that kind of settled itself out when we stopped building houses. Um, and now it's coming up again, from what I've heard, that um, PLA discussions, uh, I guess, at the county level, uh, include language that uh, the local quarries, because they are not uh, properly represented, are not eligible to provide rock to local projects. Therefore, again, we're hiring trucks out of the county, Central Valley, to fill with rock, bring it to Sonoma County and back, and it's completely defeating a lot of the purposes as far as I'm concerned. I no longer have a vested interest. I've been out of that business for 15 years. But uh, when we look at transportation and vehicle miles traveled and trucks on the road that everybody hates, um, we're creating a bigger problem. And it just feels like there's an opportunity maybe that this body can make a statement um, suggesting maybe uh, that that decision gets modified. And just a quick, uh, thank you, Brian. Just a quick correction. The city of Santa Rosa is the one that is drafting their project labor agreement right now. Uh, from what I understand, it's going into effect on July 1st and it will affect all contracts, public works contracts in the, within the city of Santa Rosa above a half a million dollars. The county is also revising their eight year old or so project labor agreement. If you guys remember eight years ago or something, they put a $10 million single project agreement on that. They're watching with interest what the city of Santa Rosa does. And I think what Brian's talking to really goes to the heart of a lot of the issues that we're talking about with vehicle miles traveled. And, and if, if a jurisdiction or whatever is now putting, um, you know, a, a labor issue in front of an environmental issue, I think it, it does have at least some means for discussion at this, at this level. So that's what we had talked about bringing it up. So thank you, Brian, for bringing that up. Don't know if anybody has any comment on that, Rick. Not on that, but I wanted to go back to that question you asked me about the agenda. Yes, sir. Uh, the, the answer I gave you is based on Robert's Rules of Order. Um, an agenda belongs to the body. It usually is approved at the beginning, but there's nothing that stops the group from amending it later. However, 
there may be special rules in the case of a public body like this. I am not familiar. This is the first time I've been on a public body like this. Uh, something like the Academic Senate and Sonoma State, which I'm very familiar with. The answer I gave before, I, I would stand by. So somebody such as perhaps Drew uh, <laughs> might know better whether, because of the requirement of public notice of an agenda, whether we can change it. Thank you. A comment from Sierra Club on PLAs? <laughs> I thought that would hit home. Uh, is that something we can consider? What's that? We have public online. I don't know who's online other than our speaker from Smart. I saw, I, there was somebody else. I saw a woman there from Blubberg. Right. I didn't know if we were going to be introducing the online folks or not in introductions, but we've already passed that. So we'll go back to that in just a second. Yeah, she introduced herself. Um, Anyways, and Robin Bartholo just appeared. She's a <laughs> member of the committee. So, all right. Any other public comments? And uh, we did have uh, you introduce yourself looking for a ride from Cloverdale. So what that actually means is that there is no transportation from Cloverdale other than the bus, which limits where you can go and how many suitcases you can have with you and so forth. And so that's really a very short way of saying there's no Lyft, there's no Uber, there's no taxis, there's no type of transportation other than only the bus. So as an example for how that effect has an effect on people, um, I'm going to Florence next month and I don't have a way to get to the airport with my luggage and so forth. So, I'm just bringing this to your attention. Again, I shop around all the bodies that I can find to make my case, but it's ridiculous. I can't get there from here. So that's my pitch. Okay, thank you. And Joanne, you want to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Joanne Parker, Grants and Legislative Affairs Manager for SMART. And again, apologies, I'm not there in person. I hope you can hear me okay. I had a uh, my road blocked for most of the afternoon, so I wasn't able to drive in, but I appreciate the opportunity to update you all on what we're up to. Okay, thank you. And uh, oh, I heard something. Anyways, we're on to administrative items, and I'm going to defer to Drew and Mosa for the uh, April 24th meeting minutes. Any motion to approve the minutes? I'll move to approve. Second. Second. Any discussion? I'll just point out, I, I really like the uh, designation of Chair ice Mr. Chair. Plessy as the ice chair. Yeah, I, I thought that was cool. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I wanted to make that comment, but it is summary, and so I accepted that title. I'll, I'll capitalize it on my copy. <laughs> I'll, move, I'll move, move to approval of the minutes. With the amendment, you know, to revise eyes to buy, please. <laughs> Abstain. All in favor? I see one abstention. Any? Two abstention. Three, four. Or... And John abstained also. Uh, any nays? I don't see none. But I think, uh, Jake, you mentioned in one of the meeting, members can vote even though on the minutes, even though they did not attend that meeting. And is this the case still? Well, uh, if you scroll that. There we go. I, wa I was told that when I was chairing another committee that. that you don't have to abstain. You can if you wish, I guess. Yeah. Okay. okay. So motions carried. Thank you for the for that. And we're on to uh, Shauna, you and Joanne for Measure M presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as we do, just as a quick reminder, as we do each month, we bring you a Measure M project sponsor who will give a breakdown of 
the projects from Measure M that they currently have active. That means they have open appropriations or they are they have otherwise activity on a Measure M project. This month we will uh, we are having we've invited uh, Smart to come and talk about the Northwest Railroad right of way, otherwise known as the multi use path. For SMART, and I will turn it over to Joanne Parker. Thank you, Shauna. We're going to talk about more than that, if that's okay. <laughs> uh, I, I've given a presentation before some of you in the past, as has our chief financial officer, who I believe is in the room. I can't see, so you guys have to tell me. Heather McKillop is in there. They're here. Yes. They're here. Okay. Eddie's there too. Oh, good. Eddie Cummins, our general manager, they're there to have a conversation with you as well. And again, I apologize that I am not there in person. I'm all dressed up and ready to get there, but my road was blocked. So I appreciate the opportunity to um, to walk through a few things with you uh, online. And I believe, Drew, I can share. Let's try this. Okay, and then we'll go from the beginning. Will it let me do it from the beginning? Are you all seeing the slide presentation or? We are, thanks, Joanna. Okay, great. So again, my name's Joanne Parker. I'm the Grants and Legislative Affairs Manager for SMART, I've been with the district for 13 years, um, and I'm really pleased to bring this update to you because we have done a lot of great work coming out of the pandemic. <clears throat> First, a little overview of what we're going to talk about. Um, we'll give you an update on SCTA funded SMART projects, uh, and then a general update on SMART activities, and then we'll open it up to questions, and you're welcome to ask any of us questions. Uh, we currently have two open appropriations with um, SCTA. One is for a million dollars worth of the Runner Park Regional Traffic Mitigation Fees. We've fully expended it through June 30 of this year. It was used to uh, complete engineering and permitting on two critical gap closures, one between Pen Grove and uh, South Point in Petaluma, which is fairly close to the um, McDowell Crossing for those who aren't as familiar with Petaluma, and the other from Roner Park to Santa Rosa, from Golf Course to Bellevue, Southwest Santa Rosa area. Um, it's about 5.7 miles worth of project total, and we've completed the design work and have allocated the matching grant funds for construction and are ready to take it to construction this fall. Um, the second piece of money that is SCTA supported is the Measure M Rail 5%. Um, we have $2 million appropriated for engineering design and ultimately for the completion of construction of the Petaluma North infill station at Corona Road. Um, and that project is also fully designed. We're going to combine those projects as well as a rail and pedestrian bike improvements uh, project uh, across McDowell. All three of those will be rolled into one construction contract that will be awarded, we're estimating right now in October. Um, and then we will start construction and have completion staggered in the order listed below, which is the McDowell work will be, get, be done first, Petaluma Station will be completed after that, and then the pathway segments will be open following that. Uh, this is the full funding plan for those that combines project. The, the column that says completed, that's where the bulk of the um, Measure M rail and the all of the traffic impact fee, which is line four in, in the funding plan there, that's where they're located. They'd advance the projects to construction. The construction phase elements are a series of grants that are funding uh, plus some um, Measure Q to complete construction. In total, the contract is estimated in the, the project, including construction management is esti estimated for construction in the $27 million range. Now I wanna take a step back and kind of catch you all up. If you haven't heard, our general manager, who's there in the room with you, um, has led us all uh, with his arrival about a year and a half ago through a really healthy exercise in creating a very defined uh, mission and vision for the organization. and. It's called the Smart House. This is a graphic of it. Uh, it leads us towards a vision of a smarter transportation for a smarter tomorrow with a mission of connecting communities, as you can see from my, I gotta get the right 
my my little logo up here. Um, it's built on focused of, on the four main areas for our organization. One is uh, ridership. And there's a whole bunch of different activities that that feed into a healthy ridership for the system. Pathways, completing our system, uh, um, enhancing the system we've already built, extensions, completing the full build out of our uh, passenger rail network and freight, which is a relatively new responsibility for us. We've taken it on about two years ago. <clears throat> and through it all, we exhibit the values of safety first, integrity and transparency in what we do, stewardship of the public good that is our, um, our infrastructure and continually trying to uh, seek improvements. So on the first pillar, recent ridership initiatives, focusing on some service improvements that have been implemented coming out of the pandemic, which was challenging, I'm sure, for you as well as for us, uh, we've been able to fully restore service levels to where we were at just before the pandemic hit us. 38 weekday trips and 12 trips every weekend day. Uh, the 12 is actually higher than we were before the pandemic. We had 10 weekend trips before the pandemic. We've uh, notably improved weekend connections to the Larkspur Ferry with the 12 weekend trips, but we've done a bunch more. There's, there's a facilitation of the Muirwood shuttle connection at Larkspur. So for those who don't know, in the summer times, uh, Marin Transit runs a shuttle direct from the Larkspur Ferry parking area to Muir Woods, so you can take the train down and catch that shuttle and not really have to worry about the 101 at all. Uh, we've also implemented uh, service to select Giants games, and it's proven quite popular in uh, particular over the last couple of weeks, and we've added a for the last game uh, weekend game, we added a third car to that train. We've also added late night service on Friday and Saturday. There's an extra round trip. It's called the Starlighter. We encourage everybody to get out, go to restaurants along the corridor and uh, take the train home. And then we've, uh, we're adding uh, post fireworks service uh, for this upcoming 4th of July at Marin County Fair. In the arena of initiatives associated with our passenger fares, uh, we have had a discount on our fares coming out of the pandemic of an average of about 40%. So right now, for if you're paying cash as an adult rider to board the train is half what it was. It's a little, it's a dollar fifty per zone, so it's a dollar fifty off where it was before. We've extended suspension of daily parking fees at smart owned park and ride lots, so you can park for free during the day. We're implementing a further reduced rate of our 31 day pass product. Now, for those who don't know on the Clipper card, you can get a 31 day pass product that will give you all access to the system, um, all, all locations, all trips. Uh, and we are pricing it to recognize the fact that the work week commute pattern has seemed to settled on a three day work week. And so this price point is assuming somebody traveling three days on the system. The rest of it is all bonus. If you want to get on for any other purpose, please do. Um, it's uh, $117 for adults and our senior youth and disabled rates are 50% off that. So 58.50. We're continuing participation in the regional Clipper Start Low Income Fair program. For our riders, that's 50% off a uh, cash, uh, a single ride trip. Um, we are also participating in the regional Bay Pass program, which is free to all uh, students of Santa Rosa Junior College who are riding any system, not just ours, any Clipper enabled system. We began a program last fall of implementing free field trips for K through 12 students, and I'm happy to report that we're, uh, uh, we're on the books for 1,000 students and 42 trips up until now. We're hoping to grow that next school year. Uh, we've, and we're implementing free summer youth program along with our partners at Marin Transit, Santa Rosa City Bus, Sonoma County Transit, and Petaluma Transit for this summer, June to August. And reports are that the youth are riding the trains in great numbers and that the, um, the schools and other, other organizations that are running student based programs this summer have engaged organizations like Santa Rosa City Bus in way higher numbers than they anticipated doing travel training to get ready to bring their kids and their summer programs out on the on the various transit systems. So it seems like people are 
really coming out of the pandemic and getting their kids engaged in learning how to ride the ride, ride the system so they can access opportunities. Other initiatives to advance ridership include improvements in general first last mile access to the system as well as information. So we've worked with Google to improve trip planning. We've improved access to real time train location data. We've implemented overnight parking at smart park and ride lots for the first time. You may park overnight for a $5 fee. And upcoming uh, this fall, we're gonna have real-time electronic train arrival signage. And then most excitedly, we are la we've launched a microtransit pilot project called Smart Connect at the Sonoma County Airport. I know some of you were there. Thank you for coming to the ribbon cutting event. I hope you had a good time. It was, it was very enjoyable to see the excitement about this uh, system and um, hopeful that it will become extremely popular and everybody will be requesting it at the at their respective stations. So we've had results. This is a graph showing April 2023 versus pre-pandemic April 2019 um, over time, the, the time period. So you can see the huge drop that was the, the first month of the pandemic and then a slow rebuild and we are basically where we left off before the pandemic. Uh, in fact, if you look at all the systems in the Bay Area, and this is the most recent data that you can get through the National Transit Database, it shows that we are the number one recovered system in the Bay Area. The other rail operators at the far right of the chart, also in orange, uh, we're at 97% in April. We actually were at 100 and I think it was 2% in May, and I bet you we're going to be even higher for June. Um, so we are carrying as basically as many people as we were before the pandemic, which is really wonderful. The other thing that's really interesting is during the pandemic and continuing on afterwards, bringing bikes on board has proven to be extremely popular. Uh, to date, we are way above where we had ever been previously on a record for bringing bikes on board. We've carried uh, 83,000 uh, to date, and then we're projected to carry uh, 90,000 before uh, we're done with this fiscal year, which is 30% higher than the previous record. So people are using it for their first and last mile. Um, and that uh, means the system is working as designed. So moving on to the next pillar, which is a pathways. This is a snapshot on the right-hand side of our adopted 23-24 budget that our board approved last week. We're going to stay on our strategy of constructing the funded segments of the pathway that we're funding largely with grants supplemented with Measure Q. We're continuing to design and permit other sections of the pathway so that they're ready to go for competition for grants. We're publishing updated pathway maps and we're developing and implementing a wayfinding program and I highly encourage you all to um, uh, to go to our website to find more information. Um, but there will be a virtual public workshop on the 29th, which is what Thursday, Thursday from six to seven uh, regarding our smart wayfinding plan. So I encourage you all to participate and weigh in on what the signage in and around our pathway will look like. Upcoming uh, improvements on the pathways, just to summarize, and I may skip back to the budget to highlight a couple of more things in a second, but uh, we have a section of the pathway, the lower right picture there is of the Payran to Lakeville section of the pathway that's been under construction far longer than we thought it would because we had such an extreme winter weather season, but it is on the cusp of opening. Um, and then we're going to award a contract uh, in the uh, in a couple of months, early fall, to complete what I think is going to be a very popular segment, even for people in Sonoma County, from the Marin Civic Center at McGinnis um, to Smith's Branch Road to McGinnis Regional Park, where uh, if anyone has a kid and you want to go to the batting cages, I highly recommend you just go down there after this pathway is built and um, and walk the one mile over or bicycle over and there are batting cages there, which are kind of few and far between. Uh, so uh, the other sections that are, are going under construction, as I mentioned before, as part of that group, project delivery where we're putting the Petaluma North Station with sections of the pathway will be uh, commencing with the Petaluma South Point to Pengrove Main Street and Runner Park Golf Course to Santa Rosa Bellevue sections um, coming up starting later this summer. I will just scroll back because you will see that, um, except for I can't figure out how to scroll back. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, 
you see in the upper right, there's a construct construct funded segments of the pathway. There are a couple more sections that are listed there that I didn't mention in the other slide. And I just wanted to come back to mention that there, there's progress happening on other sections that have secured grant funds to construct. And one of them is Hannah Ranch to Vintage Way in Novato, which currently has no other parallel route that you can travel on. So it's one of those gap closures like a Roner Park to Santa Rosa section. And then we uh, are on the cusp. We're hopeful of having a final blessing by the California Transportation Commission um, next Wednesday to add $6 million in, in state funds to build a section of the path that had 2 million in SCTA recommended funds. So those two pieces will be combined to build the Guerneville Road to Airport Boulevard pathway. So from the Santa Rosa North Station to Airport Boulevard. Um, so we're on the, on the cusp of having that fully funded for construction as well. So it's pretty exciting. Moving on to the third pillar, our extensions. Again, here's a slide showing our adopted 23-24 budget. You can see there's a lot of activity in there associated with extensions. Notably, as I mentioned before, construction of the Petaluma North Station. Resumption of the Windsor extension is also on the horizon very soon. That same California Transportation Commission meeting in a couple of days um, will uh, is has a staff CTC staff recommendation to uh, add $30 million to the Windsor completion, uh, which is very exciting because uh, once that is funded through this $30 million to Windsor, it will in turn free up regional measure three bridge toll funds to be put towards the Healdsburg extension to match some money we just got earlier this year, 34 million in TIRCP. So we don't have a project delivery outline schedule yet on this one. Give us a little time. We're gonna figure out where we're at. We're waiting on another piece of money that we haven't heard from yet from the Federal Railroad Administration. And then we'll uh, begin talking about project delivery on Healdsburg and efforts to fully fund that project. Uh, I will note that we do have sufficient operating revenues for Windsor, Healdsburg, and Cloverdale in our financial documents. Uh, it's worth noting because it is a big, just like having your project, your pathway projects fully designed makes it appealing for construction grants. Same thing if you're committing operating resources like we do for the pathway as well, it makes it uh, appealing for uh, capital grants. And then on East West, I'll just mention we're very busy working on State Route 37 corridor activities with our partners, so SCTA and the other county level agencies. Um, and most importantly for us, Caltrans is doing a ton of work on service planning as well as trying to figure out how to advance the East West project into a, a more robust level of development. So they are, Caltrans has taken the lead on submitting several federal railroad applications for that East West project. Uh, specifics, again, Petaluma North construction starts this fall, as does the Windsor extension construction. We'll be working some more to figure out uh, a project delivery timeline and approach on Healdsburg. And then on Cloverdale, we do have a pending Federal Railroad Administration grant request that we submitted asking for funds to complete federal environmental clearance to make that project more appealing for federal railroad fund investment. And as I mentioned, Caltrans is submitting a similar application for East-West to the, to the federal, actually it's to the Federal Highway Administration, they're submitting that one. So coming back to the adopted budget, uh, again, the four pillars, uh, I'll just point out that the three that are, that are contributing to our passenger mainline have about a third each of our adopted budget uh, contributing to them. Freight is a smaller budget and is a separate entity. Um, and we've not discussed it here because that's not sort of the rail and pathway purview of Measure M, but we're available for questions. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you for your time. Great presentation. Do I add a lot of information in there? Oops. Um, I've got a quick question. Okay. That sounds weird. I'm sorry. Oh, a quick question on the Healdsburg portion. You mentioned that uh, part of it was going to be a design build. How do you guys see that shaking out? Are you going to leave the river crossing for the future, or what? What part of that would get built out before the rest of it? 
Uh, I am a bit, I'm a bit of a loss here because I can't see my colleagues in the room, but I don't know. Uh, Eddie, do you want to take that one or would you like? Uh, Lopped it over to Eddie. <laughs> I, will, I will take this one, Joanne. Okay, I thought so. Right. So this is when we have a conversation. First off, Eddie comes for those of you that I don't know. I come most. Come closer. Oh, oh so you sorry. Here. Also for the mic. Very good. Yeah. We're talking the mic. Okay. And make sure it's your mic. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Eddie. <laughs> so we've had a lot of conversations, and we've got to work through some details. So um, we give this presentation quite a bit that we talk about these puzzle pieces of funding that we're going for. Maybe you've seen that. Um, and so we're still waiting on a couple of these puzzle pieces. One we will find out this week. Uh, as uh, Joanne mentioned, we are on the, uh, uh, the staff recommendation, so we feel good about that, but it still needs to come to fruition. Um, but as we talk about Hillsburg, um, what I've been talking to staff about is I spend quite a bit of time up there. And whenever I'm out talking, everybody thinks, what they tell me is that the bridge is the biggest piece. That, that's the hardest part to do. I hear that. And so I think that if we have enough money, that's what we do first, right? So when we start in Hillsburg, we, uh, we, uh, if, if everything works out, that's where I would like to focus, focus on getting the bridge done, getting the pathway next to the bridge completed um, and creating that usable segment. But that's the way we're thinking about it right now. Obviously all these details have to be worked out. We have to see how much money's available, but whatever we have there, uh, we wanna get as much done as possible. And I think that there's a lot to just People realize and smarts coming to Hillsburg when that bridge goes in. Absolutely. Any any more used bridges down in Texas that uh, <laughs> you go? We'll grab? be on the lookout. I'm yeah. not aware of any that are out there. Um, I've looked on Facebook Marketplace, but I don't see any bridges. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But I would question? just say this: there's a lot of exciting things that have been reported up here by Joanne, and there's many of you that have seen this presentation. I don't know what 50 times, probably. Um, but it never gets old and it's a lot of things that's happened, but here's what I can tell you is there is nothing that has been done at SMART, at least since I've been here, that wasn't community driven. Everything that's up there that's been done is things that people told us we need this and we've delivered and our ridership reflects that. Awesome. Rick, Rick first and then Harris. Thank you, John, and thank you, Eddie and Joanne. Uh, some of my acquaintances are former employees of the Northwestern Pacific Railroad, and I've heard from them that there are opportunities for obtaining funding to develop freight railroads that are considerably um, easier to get and, and, and more available than those for passenger service. Um, and they believe that there is some significant untapped market for freight service between um, airport and Cloverdale. And they point out that um, uh, freight is generally much more lucrative than passenger service. Passenger services never pay for themselves. They've always gotta be subsidized, whereas freight service makes money. And they also point out that once a track is laid for freight trains, uh, it can be used for passenger trains too. <laughs> So I just wanted to pass that along because it seems it seems like that might be something worth exploring. Thank you for that. And yes, we are well aware of the uh, grants that are out there. Obviously it's a federal process. It's very competitive across the country, but I can tell you this, I truly believe that I have the absolute best grants person in the business, which is Joanne Parker. <laughs> and I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, I don't think she's ever met a grant she doesn't like. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So if there's grants out there, she's she's hitting that. She's well aware that freight is an opportunity for us. And that's probably what it takes to get to Cloverdale, to be honest with you. It's going to be a combination of freight and passenger. And we need to be focusing on grants on both sides of that. Thank you. And Harris, we are. Harris and then Mosa. Follow-up question on Healdsburg. So when we were last up there walking around looking at things, mm -hmm. um, there was still a lot of conversation back and forth between the location for the station. Has that moved any closer to a decision? And who and how will that decision be made? What I will tell you is that's going to be a public process. I do have a meeting tomorrow afternoon in Healdsburg with city staff, you know, just to kind of talk about, you know, what can you do? What's possible? 
Um, but uh, as far as I know, I'm scheduled, my team and I are scheduled to uh, present at the August uh, City Council meeting in Hillsburg. And so we will be there, we will be talking about pros and cons and different options. And then it's, it's up to the public to weigh in on that and let the chips fall where they may. Um, Smart's uh, stance on this is we want to do what the community wants. Makes sense. Uh, Mosa and then. Yeah. Uh, good to have you first, you know, and in fact, I'm very pleased, you know, to see the progress uh, with, you know, Smart. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the presentation that, uh, you know, I saw reflects the community driven uh, new vision of SMART, which I'm happy, you know, to see. Mm -hmm. So I have, uh, you know, a couple of questions in the presentation I heard, you know, the Hillsburg is uh, extension is half funded, you know, is it, you know, like, when you talk about Hillsburg, do you talk about only the city or clever there, you know, like, uh, and the second question, if you may, you know, regarding we, or I read in the news, you know, SMART is preparing, you know, for, you know, an extension of the sales, you know, measure. If you would please, can, can you brief us on that effort? Yes, so <clears throat> first question first. Um, when we talk about Hillsburg, we're talking about Hillsburg, right? So we look at the different segments. We think about Windsor, we think about Hillsburg, we think about Cloverdale, and we're always going after different funding sources. That's the one thing about grants and things like that that are out there. So they all have different kind of strings attached to them and different criteria, and you got to kind of see what fits in. So right now, when we're talking about the money that we have towards Hillsburg, we're talking about Hillsburg. There was one piece of the puzzle. Again, I present this, these puzzle pieces um, that was $55 million uh, for TIRCP round two. We were not successful in that one. Um, so there's two pieces out there right now, one for the $30 million um, that will be decided this week. I think it's on, the, on June 28th. And then there's another $28 million uh, grant request. It's a federal request, which is called Chrissy. Um, and we expected to hear about that one in June, but that seems to have kind of been on delay. And so we may not hear about that one until next month or even maybe longer than that. So we'll just have to see. But right now, just to be very clear, we're talking about Hillsburg to the city of Hillsburg. The sales? The sales tax. Well, it's so interesting. <clears throat> if, you're, if you're out there and you want some interesting reading, um, the Marin Civil, Civil Grand Jury just released a report on Friday um, that encourages the smart board to take a look at uh, what it's going to take to uh, extend its sales tax. And so they only had three recommendations and almost all of them are related to the sales tax extension. So I'll be reporting that to the board, get some feedback, see how the board wants to move forward. Um, obviously, you know, anytime you look at this, I get asked all the time, when are you going to go back to the voters? Less than 67% is a big number. Yeah, it is. That's a big number. Um, and it's tough, and I know it's going to be challenging no matter what. I feel, and I'm very confident, you look at the list of things, you look at our ridership, I'm confident that we've made a ton of progress in the last couple of years. Is it enough? Well, that's a good question. So our sales tax expires in 2029. So, you know, you would think you would want to go during a presidential election. Makes sense, right? So you have 24, you have 28. Of course, you could go in 26 or 30. Um, so those are all options, um, but the board's going to weigh in on this. Um, obviously, we're going to owe a response back to the Marin Civil Grand Jury, and uh, we'll go from there. So more to come, and it's going to it's going to come quick because, like I said, this will be uh, I'll be presenting this at the July board meeting. Well, the good news is your operating budget, your your operating costs are contained in your budget now. And, and we went when we went to the voters last time, if I remember correctly, that was not really the case. So. That's a huge step up for you guys. So good job on that. Uh, Jeff. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, having been born here, I can remember when uh, that same railway right away brought lumber to me, Clark Lumber, and um, <laughs> yeah. moved all of our freight um, up and down the corridor. And we watched that go away and a lot more trucks hit the road. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just curious how freight would be handled mechanically if you guys move into freight. Would this be new trains on the same tracks? Would this be 
three passenger cars and a freight car. Is there is there talk about that yet? How that would look? So we're already doing freight because we own the freight railroad. We're running freight now. We run on mostly on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Right now, the way we do it, and of course, you know, it really depends on how many customers customers you have. We are a common carrier, so if somebody wants something, we're required to bring it to them. Um, so right now, what we do is we operate after revenue service. So it comes in on the main line on the smart on the smart track. Um, right around 10 o'clock at night. So it's sitting at the Ignacio Y waiting on uh, revenue service to end. And then we come in. I do think that as the tracks gets north of uh, the airport, I think it is going to open up some opportunities for freight. And so we're excited about that. Um, you know, we, we're, we're out all the time talking to people um, about going back to freight because obviously a lot of people used to use it and you know some are interested some are having conversations with us nothing that you know i'm ready to report publicly or any deals done or anything like that um but we are making we are making progress do you have a dedicated freight type car or is it just the passenger cars that oh no we have freight cars we have we have freight locomotives freight cars so when we when we uh purchased the rights to nw pico we got all of their equipment so yeah we're a full-on railroad it's out at shellville that's where if you drive out to Shellville out on 121, you can see all of our equipment out there. Thank you. Yeah, so we go up to the Cal Northern and pick up uh, pick up freight, and then we bring it down. Our customers right now are all in Petaluma. Okay, yeah, Jerry. Yeah, I'm Jerry. Um, about 18 months ago, I was appointed to the Policy Advisory Council of the MPC, and so I thought it was a good idea if I started writing on transit so I've been using your service. Now, last awesome. time I used it when, when you first opened up. It's an amazing service. It really is good. And at the last meeting that we had at the Policy Advisory Council since I've been taking, I noticed over the last four months how much more the ridership had occurred. And I actually caught one, one uh, train on the way back after a ball game, and it was really crowded. So the service works really great. Um, there's a, a couple of things that... I am disturbed about. One was, I like the idea of having the bus service going from uh, the end of the line today to the airport, but it bothered me from a system point of view, whether that was actually done through, why it wasn't done through the county bus. Mm -hmm. I mean, that seemed that their mission ought to be a mission to take care of these things and you shouldn't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. You should be an expert on, on rail and they should be an expert on buses. That's one point. The second one is I take it down to the ferry uh, and jump on the ferry. It's disappointing the gap between there. Mm -hmm. If I walk the bridge, it's a long way. I take the shortcut mm -hmm. across the road Most now. Do. And if the weather's not nice, mm -hmm. it really cuts down on your service. And we need some sort of solution for that as well. And probably mm -hmm. even more than we did the airport because of the number of people who go down that route. I'd like to know if we have a solution that we're looking at. And the last one is this. I'm also on the task force that's working on regional management uh, through the MTC. And I keep trying different routes and I use your service quite a bit. I'm disappointed that we can't coordinate. The train gets to the Marin Center uh, four minutes after Golden Gate leaves. Uh, the coordination that we need between the various services is something that uh, I'm hoping that we get around to. And I also wanna make sure that uh, you have a seat, uh, that SMART has a seat uh, on the council that is going to be launched, that's going to be part of the regional management, because that's the place where we're going to try to take the 27 different mm -hmm. transit districts and make them function like one. Mm -hmm. So I agree. Um, I agree. <laughs> I, I mean, I, you can't listen to me talk more than 10 minutes and, and not hear me say that um, first and last mile is Smart's biggest, biggest challenge. I say it's his Achilles heel, right? Um, it's a real challenge. Step number one is the uh, the smart connect right at the airport. Um, there was there was you know a lot of excitement around that, a lot of horsepower behind it. So a lot of people wanted it. To be honest with you, there's there wasn't anything like that in Sonoma or Sonoma County, right? This is something I did at my previous place. I know it works well. I know it fills a gap. I know it uh, it it works. And so this, in my mind, is proof of concept. You get it there, um, people are excited about it, people use it, it's successful, guess what? Then we duplicate it at Larkspur, okay? Yep. okay? So this would work very well. Um, you need more than probably, believe it or not, you need probably more than just a terminal, 
right? Or, or the ferry terminal. You need to be able to hit the hotels and hit some of the restaurants and some of those other things so that you keep that vehicle busy all the time. That's one thing we were able to do at the airport is it serves a 1.5 mile area, right? Not just the airport, that's obviously going to be the main driver, but it also hits the hotel, it hits the movie theater, it hits several businesses, it hits several uh, areas that provide services for Sonoma County. So that's kind of the plan there. Um, our, our planning staff works really hard on trying to line up these connections and it's it's very tough it, it's tough and, and you know and that's why MTC is moving to yeah, where exactly. they're moving um, I don't know exactly how that's all going to be laid out I attend meetings on it all the time I know the smart, smart uh, small operators are going to have a couple of seats and you know I will definitely throw my hat in the ring to uh, to be one of those yeah, and I also want to and, and to make this comment um, your staff is amazing. The guys Thank on you. the trains, um, they're knowledgeable. If they don't know the answer to a question, they go and get the answer to the yeah. question. I was standing at the Ronald Park station and when you talked about freight. And I said, what's this extra rail doing here? There's only a foot over. And the conductor didn't know. So he went out and he went out and found and came back and said, it's for freight. And I said, what do you mean it's for freight? He said, well, the station's too close yeah. for our cars. The rail cars are bigger. And so we have to go wider yeah. for the rail. So I knew we were running rail. Yeah, that's Thanks. it. Thank you for the comments and mindful of the time, but I, I know we got Tom and then Steve. You know, I don't know if there were any others, but we'll probably have to cut it off at that point. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I want to uh, congratulate you on your ridership recovery. That's quite, thank you. A, quite an achievement. And it, it kind of builds the momentum behind the ask to come. Um, and in the spirit of making sure we bring in as many people into uh, enthusiasm about, about the smart a vision, a new vision. I want to ask some questions about the integration of the pathway with the, the train services. Uh, many of us have been wanting to see these paths completed for a long time. And I'm curious what your phasing is in terms of completing the multi-use path, multi paths before line extensions, especially to Windsor and, and even Hillsburg. Do you think the line extension, the path will be done to the airport before the Windsor project is begun, or will we still have to wait for the bike paths to be completed? Mm. Or is that part of your planning? So Joanne, do you have the right answer for that? I think so. Um, so first of all, as we build extensions, we're building the pathway with it. So the Windsor extension includes the pathway, um, and it actually includes a couple of enhancements to it that the town of Windsor has requested and is partially funding. Uh, in terms of the core system, believe it or not, all that list of stuff I told you earlier, that's a whole lot of what you haven't seen in the ground in Sonoma County. And all of it is funded with the exception of one piece of the pathway that we are partnering with Sonoma County, with SCTA on to submit a federal application. Um, but all of it is funded for construction from uh, the completion of the PayRan piece that we are about to open up all the way north through to um, it will be to Windsor once we finish Windsor, except for one piece in Pengrove, um, the piece that we're partnering on an application with SCTA on. So it's all funded. It's a question of uh, completing the construction on it, which will take some time. They're very large projects and they're extremely complicated, particularly for permitting and mitigation. Um, I know we just took a we just took a, a tiger a salamander. Uh, mitigation <laughs> to our board uh, last our last board meeting for 1.7 million dollars for uh, pathway sections in uh, southwest Santa Rosa so they're all in the works um, and they will be done with the exception of the one unfunded piece right now being that east railroad to main street from Katati to Pengrove that one's extremely complicated and expensive and we're partnering with SCTA and all the other jurisdictions on a group application for federal grants, but the rest of it is secured and in process. Okay, so is there a map that shows all the bike path? And yes, have you taken a look at our website lately? There's an interactive map that is updated as pieces head into construction. Yeah, because I, I think it'd be helpful to have that. <laughs> I know, I know it's in there, but I'm thinking for the public and for the promotional campaigns to come. I want, you know, I'm in Sonoma Valley. Many people down there are a little bit skeptical of the train. Mm -hmm. I did get to take it for the first time. Um, 
before you implemented the long mm -hmm. date night return trip. So I got stuck in, in San uh, Rafael, but had to take a bus back. Um, and, but I'm glad you have that new program because I'm looking mm -hmm. forward to doing that. The other question had to do with the electronic signage that you've just implemented. That sounds really cool. And I'm curious if the system would be at all available for potential adoption by the bus system because we want to integrate these systems. And I think the bus system's next bus is not terribly useful. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we, we, we work closely with our partners. I think that technology can be adapted. Um, you know, it, it, it's something that, you know, you get out, you put it in and you see how it works and, and, and then you share with others. But we meet regularly with our bus partners and we really have uh, great relationships across the board. So we'll absolutely share that information. I think when it comes to the pathways, I think something that's important to remember is our strategy changed on the pathways. The strategies a year or two ago was get everything shovel ready. My recommendation to the board was let's build it and the board agreed. So that's why you've seen movement uh, as of recent of, of getting things done, but we've been moving forward with uh, um, putting concrete in the ground. And that's what I hear from the bicycle community. That's what they tell me every time I talk to them, like, yeah, 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 whatever, Eddie, concrete in the ground, <laughs> right? Did that, right did I, is that a good quote? <laughs> okay, excellent. Steve? You got it. You got it, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you. Any other questions? Because that was a lot of information. Joanne and Eddie, thank you guys very you. much for coming and presenting to us. And thanks again to this committee for all the great questions. Okay. Thank you. We'll be, we'll, be providing the, we'll be providing the presentation to Drew. I have a couple of page number corrections for you, Drew, and then he'll get it on your website. Thanks. Thanks. Hope you get out of your driveway by tomorrow. <laughs> Me too. I think it's okay <clears throat> now. Thank you, Joanne. All right, and Shauna, you're you're up again on the Measure M project. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is an informational item, and it is something that we bring to you every year. We we take it to both the Technical Advisory Committee, the Transit Technical Advisory Committee. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Heather, and the Citizens Advisory Committee. And it is the presentation schedule for these types of presentations for the year. Um, so we bring it to you in case you have any questions about it, when you think someone should be here, or if there is something that is not on the list that you would like to hear about, um, hopefully we've covered everything. Uh, but if not, then please uh, feel free to contact me directly. I have one correction is that um, bike month, uh, we did not have any funding from That's SETA correct. in this fiscal year. That so, but it's still showing on that it's list. It's still showing on the list. Yeah. I can remove it. Okay. Thank you. Or you could give us some money. <laughs> <laughs> that is completely spent out. We have been very successful in helping to fund uh, Bike Month and Bike to Work. So. Thank you, Shauna. James, you're up. Numbers, numbers, and more numbers. So included in your packet are the standard uh, financial reports, right, straight from the financial system, as well as a uh, tabular format, which is easier to read, that shows all the measure and programs. Uh, a couple of the takeaways is that we are at a point in our uh, revenue where we have collected three full quarters of sales tax. So this revenue shows through March. So the taxes that, you, that were paid in March were received by the SCTA in May and then are shown on these financials in front of you. Our current growth is at 2%, which is what we were projecting within the preliminary budget. It's more than what we were projecting uh, at, when we passed the budget last November for these financials. Uh, with that, I would just say that, you know, I can answer any questions that you have on the financials and, um, you know, we are kicking off audits right now and our auditors will be here later this year uh, to present, per, you know, to present the full audited financials. Great. Any questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah. Mosa? You mentioned 2%, you know, within our projection. Yeah. How is it in comparison to the previous revenue, you know, the growth, is it the same rating, you know, 2% or is it declining, increasing? So, so our, um, so when, when we look, when we look at increases, 
uh, we can look at it as an, from an audited standpoint, right? So talking from an audited standpoint, last year we had an 11% increase. Uh, the year before that, we had a 13% increase. Um, the year before that was when COVID hit, so we had a 5% drop. Um, so our, our growth is, um, has been projected for two years now. So last year, our growth was projected to um, essentially slow down and then recover back to trend, which is closer to 3%. Uh, what we found is that slowdown was not as much as we initially thought. We thought it was going to slow down to about 1% growth. We're actually about 2% growth this year, and we are projecting next year um, to potentially be a negative 1% growth before we return back to that trend of about 3%. Uh, mm. and, and the trend itself is um, what the sales tax has achieved and what was projected back in 2004. So if you go back to 2004 and you look at our financial estimates, we're between 96 and 97% right now of what we anticipated as revenue in 2004, following that 3% trend year over year. That's remarkable. I mean, 19 years, wow, great job. Uh, other comments? Let's see, this is an action item or no? Informational, okay. Thanks, James. <laughs> and regional measure three, James and David. Yeah, so this this item has been left on here from April. So April, there was a more detailed presentation about the various Regional Measure 3 programs. So Regional Measure 3, for those of you unaware, is the, um, the increase in tolls on the seven Bay Area bridges. Um, for the first time ever, Sonoma's expenditure, or the expenditure plan includes projects within Sonoma County. Uh, and the reason why we had it on here is we were wanting to announce to the committee through a handout, which we do not have ready yet, I apologize, the, that the handout is to uh, recruit members for a fiscal oversight committee. They are looking for two uh, members of a fiscal oversight committee. Uh, the, the original um, recruitment, if you will, or, or, or search went to the County Board of Supervisors and, uh, and, and since then, um, it's come to us, their application form on their website needs to be updated so that we have the right information for you. But essentially, this oversight committee meets up to four times a year. There is a $50 stipend for your time to be part of this committee. And the key thing for this committee to be aware of, uh, we will send out the invite to, so that if anyone is interested, um, they'll be able to apply to be the representative, but you cannot be a former, uh, either a current or a former member of the commission or the authority. And when I say the commission authority, I'm talking about the authority is bad and not SCTA. Uh, and so um, therefore, you know, our esteemed committee member, uh, Mr. McKenzie uh, was, was not eligible, uh, but the rest of you, as long as you are not um, contracted with the BATA authority or the commission over the last year. So if you haven't worked for BATA or contracted with BATA over the last year, you are eligible for it. Okay. Um, so if anyone has any other questions, um, you know, please reach out after we get you more information on it. If you have any, you know, um, interest right now, you're, you're welcome to reach out to myself or David sooner. Uh, we'll make sure you get the information, but we'll have, we'll have Drew send it to the whole committee. And that day, I know it'll be on that announcement, but what is the deadline for this? So it's past the deadline. And, and so it went, so it's an ASAP <laughs> request. And, yes. uh, and I think part of the reason is that SCTA received the request late from the, from the board of supervisors. And I don't, we didn't want to send you a Google form link that you click on the link and say page not available. So I'm going to get you the, get you the right information once. And then. <laughs> is it an oversight? committee only or does it have a role in funding it? Uh, I, I, a fiscal oversight committee, I do not know the, um, the actions that they have. Now there, you know, the regional measure does have an expenditure plan. Uh, so, you know, you're locked into what you're going to fund similar to measure M, you, you know, you had these locked in projects. Uh, but as far as prioritization of when the funding rolls out, I don't know uh, what the what the um, oversight committee has. I, I would assume it'd be pretty similar to what we're doing here. Um, Are there any other other unfilled positions on that oversight committee, or is it just this one? So, uh, so on on this one, um, 
the, the draft list that I got, it showed San Francisco had two unfilled positions waiting for their board of supervisors to fill and the county of Sonoma had two unfilled positions. The other positions have uh, all have folks um, that are that are filled and they're looking for a four year commitment. They're looking for okay. um, yeah, 2023 through 2027. Jake? The committee has existed for some time, but it has been inactive for obvious reasons. The money was in escrow. Mm -hmm. And so now it's re now it's activated. So uh, and I think I was first contacted, um, seems like it was about two months ago by the board by Chair Corsi. Anyway, so it'll be an, it'll be an interesting uh, assignment all right thank you and we are we got an action item coming up reschedule october 30th meeting to november 6th so that that was at the request of staff we have a um a conference that is the self-help counties coalition conference the self-help counties is a uh, essentially all of the um you know counties within within the state that have a transportation specific sales tax and uh it's it's really the the one conference that um we we go to every day the conference is called focus on the future it's a great professional development opportunity and so that we can actually attend the conference and then be sure that we can give this committee the right um attention that it needs as well as there's a side benefit our auditors would be really happy because they would then get another week to prepare for this committee as well because they normally come in the end of october we did ask to advance it a week as well and the the response from the auditors is that you know it's a tough schedule to to hit the the last uh, monday in uh, october so the ask of the committee uh would be to um, pass an action item to move it to the first monday in november can we treat that ask as a motion or do we need a motion? I'll make a motion. Second. Any discussion? I just was relieved to hear that explanation. I thought it might be uh, Shauna working on a wicked Halloween costume was your only reason. <laughs> <laughs> she does have the best. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. We'll approve it for that. That's fine. I'll vote, I'll vote for it now. All those uh, in favor of Moody moving the meeting to November 6th, raise Aye. your hands. Aye. Any opposition? Motion carries. Good job. Thank you. And we are on to Drew. Just to talk about the agenda. So how do you share a screen again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So I have for you draft um, SMTA RCK board of directors agenda. Um, consent calendar includes notice from June 12, a resolution on commendation for Margaret Fernandez um, upon her retirement here from SMTA RCK. Um, the amendment and restated lease agreement for this building. Um, for SCTA items includes state route 12, uh, full and interchange feasibility study task order. Uh, RCK items including nothing on the climate production initiative, building electrification updates from Bay Ridge and Sonoma Power, um, and the 2024 uh, State Highway Operations and Protection Program, also known as SHOP, and then your standard um, advisory committee agendas and reports for marketing and communications, climate change planning, and project and programs. Just so well done. There's no questions on it. Um, Suzanne uh, got up and left, and I know we're under announcements at this point, and I was kind of saving a spot there. So Shauna just went out there to see if she's still here so she can talk a little bit about her big announcement that came out last month, or I think it's last month, was it not? Um, and if she's not available, I guess we'll just chair it and table it until next meeting. Is she here? Oh, good. Okay. Would you like to tell us what you announced last month? See <laughs> ya. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, done such a great job. It's just hard to even imagine you not being here. I mean, I'll bet you are. <laughs> got, a, got a few trips lined up? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for your incredible service to this organization and, and what you've done to the public. Are you, do you have any plans to kind of consult after that and help whoever's in the transition? Uh, okay. You're not going to disappear completely to Antarctica or something. <laughs> that was yeah we already got that one off the list anyways thank you suzanne congratulations all right thank you any other announcements this could be a record i had one okay. yes so Susan Gorin convened in the Sonoma Valley a meeting of, I think we had seven Caltrans engineers, uh, the sheriff's office, as well as uh, Caltrans, I'm sorry, um, CHP. Eris was there to talk about one of our most problematic intersections in Sonoma Valley, the, where the McDonald's is at the intersection of Verano oh, Avenue yeah. and Highway 12. There have been, I think, six or seven collisions there in the last two years, including at least one fatality, maybe two fatalities. And um, so Caltrans has, is planning a two-phase um, improvement there. They've got some immediate monies allocated for a phase one. And the reason for the meeting was to get community feedback and uh, to kind of do some problem solving. So it was pretty impressive, I thought, both in terms of the, uh, the people that came out and had substantive things to say, as well as the creative flexibility of, of Caltrans design people to try and attack the problem. It's problematic because there are three jurisdictions there. The state has the highway, the county is on one side of the road and the city is south of there. So it's a problematic intersection from a jurisdictional point. Thought it'd be worth you all knowing about that. Do you know what they are proposing? Uh, help me out here. Um, the the short term is they've already painted the sidewalks to be more bright and uh, and prom uh, prominent. They are. I think. Do they already instigate the um, pedestrian interval, mm -hmm. or they were planning to do that? And, and the but... big the big question is whether to require. Uh, what's called split phase in the the, uh, the traffic signal strategy versus all phase, which is shutting off all vehicular traffic to allow pedestrians to move. There's not that much pedestrian traffic there to justify the safer alternative, the all phase alternative. Because it's not safe. But partly because it's not safe. We also anticipate though, they're building a hotel across the street and a county is putting a new center in just very close to that location, new community hub. So it's gonna to continue to be an increasingly congested intersection. And so we encourage, I encourage them to look at the other two adjacent intersections because we'd like to think of the, the system through that whole area. Yeah, a couple of the other things that I talked about were um, no right turn on red as a possibility and eliminating some of the slip lanes. But one of the other things that the, uh, at, at that meeting and a meeting that had happened the week before that a lot of residents of the Valley pointed out was that uh, also at that intersection is um, Maxwell Park which is a popular destination for kids and a lot uh, and, and the equity issues at that intersection because of the the difference between the, the population of the springs on the one side and the city on the other and trying to make it you know if we're putting all this money to making this park kids ought to be able to get to it under their um, right. scheme and and south of this intersection is where the bike path the like Sonoma the Crosstown former rail trail um, crosses Highway 12, but it actually doesn't cross Highway 12. There's a railing there. And one of the fatalities was a bicycle, I think, or no, pedestrian um, mm. 
trying to continue across the highway there where there's no crosswalk. It's just a wide, fast curving yeah. lane. And yet it is a natural thoroughfare for pedestrians and bicyclists. It's a very problematic intersection just south of the signal one. Thank you. Any other announcements there? Oh, I'll share a story. Since we have, have a doom gloom story about bike stuff, I'll share a happy, recent, happy yeah. recent story. <laughs> so on um, back to work day, I was, um, did as I usually do, which is ride around all the, the Energizer stations. And when I got out to Sebastopol, um, former council member Sarah Gurney and her husband were working the station and they were both wearing reflective vests that said on them Sebastopol Community Bike Patrol. And I asked them what that was, or who is that, or how do you be on it? And they said, well, it's just us. We're both retired. We just got these made and we just ride around town wearing them and people talk to us and, you know, we just do it. And I said, well, I want, to, I want to ride with you sometime. And they sent me my very own vest. And this weekend, they invited a bunch of other people. And so about a dozen of us rode about 12 miles in, through every neighborhood of Sebastopol, all wearing these vests, declaring us the bike patrol, or some of them said the bike parade. And that they don't have any particular plan to make some other thing out of this, but have noticed that drivers treat them better. Um, and a lot of people stop them to talk and that possibly some cyclists ride better <laughs> when they see the bike patrol out there. So I'm, I'm working on, you know, uh, after participating with them, taking a lot of pictures and stuff, I'm working on writing up a little piece about it, but it might be a fun thing for some of us in other cities to just, you know, put it on and go on out. Sounds cool. Brian, did you want to brag about your Tahoe bike trip? Bike ride up there? Nope. How many miles is that? That's impressive, my friend. Good job. Good job. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. Any other announcements, guys? We are adjourned. It wasn't.